Hey gearheads and welcome to Garage Talk, a discussion about all things automotive. I'm Corey. And I'm Matt. And each week this podcast will serve as a catalyst for discussion on all sorts of topics that grind our gears, rev our engines, or just need a bit more conversation. And on this week's episode, we were a bit inspired by our current GT Dream Car Bracket Challenge going on over on our Facebook and Instagram stories. If you haven't jumped in on that yet, what are you doing? (laughs) <laughs> go go vote today. Yeah. So we've had some incredible upsets. Underdog stories just completely make no sense to some of us. Uh, but some real fun competitions uh, in our head-to-head matchup. Each day we've been posting four different matchups of dream cars that you, our listeners, submitted. And we're whittling down from 64 dream cars Down to one. All the way down to one. So uh, as we record this, we are on day two of the second round of voting, which is all electrics today, all electric vehicles happening today. And it it actually happened. I was very excited that two versions of the exact same car are going up head to head against each other today. (laughs) And of course, as you're listening to this, we will have already declared a winner. And so far, it looks like you, our listening audience, is getting it right in my personal opinion. (laughs) The Audi e-tron GT versus a Porsche Taycan. Right. Uh, And it's it's a fun, compelling uh, little situation with sibling rivalry. Granny Smith's to Red Delicious. Yeah. 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 Well, sibling rivalry going on there. A little Camaro Firebird action. Yeah. You know, for those who... uh, Remember the good old days, but uh, (laughs) yeah, that's just me. Speaking of the good old days, the big plan for today's episode is to uh, talk about the cars that we want back in the automotive world that perhaps met a demise far too soon or circumstances have changed and they just make more sense now in today's market. But before we dig into that, you had some EJS news and some things you wanted to cover uh, before we dove into this episode. Yeah, so I've, I've been watching uh, different videos, different people posting about Easter Jeep Safari um, on several of the pages and things like that. I'm you also, weren't trolling, were you? you no, were probably trolling. Not, <laughs> not this time. Okay. Um, I didn't have to. That's oh. the fun thing. Oh, dear. Because um, uh, I would love to claim him as my friend. I don't personally know him, but I follow him on Facebook. Uh, Mr. Von Gittin Jr. Okay. Is crashing the party. Oh, boy. And it's fantastic. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> he showed up with a four-door Badlands Bronco to Easter Jeep Safari mm-hmm. to go kick some doors in and and spread the word a bit about uh, the Ford Bronco, the 2021 Ford Bronco. And I'm loving it because they're putting it through its paces. They're taking it out and doing with it what it's designed to do. And they're showing up some Jeeps in the process. And it's a lot of fun. Well, I will say, you know, you've had how long to develop a, a competitor to a vehicle that has had literally next to no competition right. for almost its entire existence. As of late, in its current iteration, since it's been called the Wrangler, it's really been in a class all its own. Yeah. So uh, I like it. You know, um, we've had a phrase. It's not ours by any means, but had a phrase that we keep echoing on this channel. Competition breeds innovation. So I'm like, bring it on. Absolutely. Uh, I cannot wait to see what the next generation Jeep Wrangler looks like and is capable of, thanks to some stiff competition from the Blue Oval brand. Absolutely. Uh, And... Probably the thing that caught my eye the most, other than they're running around and stirring the pot, yeah. uh, is that uh, Vaughn on one of his posts said, here at Easter Safari uh-huh. instead of Easter uh-huh. Jeep Safari. Uh-huh. So he's already, you know, kicked the Jeep part of it out. And we're, mm. this is just a four wheel drive hangout now. Yeah. So yeah. I love it. I'm excited. Oh, well, you yeah, know, to each their own. <laughs> What else you got for us, Matt? Uh, the other thing is, and this is kind of an important thing. So I I shared it out, I think, on my personal page and probably on Garage Talks page uh, a week or so ago. Um, there is a bill that is making its way through uh, legislation at the moment. It's called the RPM Bill, which is Recognizing the Protection of Motorsports Act, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. the RPM Act. And uh, what it does is those of us who are gearheads – should be in favor of this bill because it protects our right to race. Uh, And this is reading straight from SEMA's website. They've been a big proponent in pushing this. 
the EPA is banning race cars. Tell Congress to pass the RPM Act now and stop the EPA from destroying motorsports. Your member of Congress needs to hear from you, and they've actually got it's really cool. You put it, uh, you click on their link, SEMA.org, for the RPM Act, and click on the link here, put in your information, and they have in their algorithms and things with your zip code who, who your representative is, who your congressman, senators, all that good stuff, and they shoot a formed email over to them letting them know, hey, I support this bill. This needs to be a part of legislation. Uh, we need to um, restrain the EPA in this regard. So right. this would uh, essentially, uh, what the bill says is um, streetcars, or, or what the EPA is trying to do is take street vehicles, cars, trucks, and motorcycles, and they cannot be converted into race cars, according to the EPA. So essentially... Taking out the aftermarket, which is a huge... yeah. Industry. Uh, they also want more enforcement against any high performance parts. Mm. So there's a whole other industry right mm-hmm. there, mm-hmm. including superchargers, tuners, exhaust mm. systems, mm. etc. Mm. If you are one of the hundreds of thousands of enthusiasts who contacted Congress in the past, we need your support again. Go check this out. Do your research. Uh, I can't tell you to vote one way or another, but I can say that if you are a gearhead and you like race cars and race car parts. I mean, this essentially cuts the legs out from under any, if the EPA gets their way, it cuts the legs out from under any average Joe being able to go to the track on a Friday night right. or Saturday and race because they can't legally do that now in a production vehicle, right? even if it's on a track. So it's not a good thing. Right, <laughs> right. So check that out, uh, SEMA.org, and uh, there should be a link there for the RPM Act. And I'll put a link down in the show notes for that as well. So, news of the week out of the way. I'm very excited about this episode. Like yeah. I said, I was inspired by our GT Dream Car Bracket Challenge that we've got going on on our Facebook and our Instagram. And it got me to thinking, because we do have a classics section of the bracket, you know, what cars would we bring back if we could? You know, we, we've mentioned a few, at least on my list, on previous episode. We've talked about some, but we've never, like, actually put a list down of, here are my top five, here are your top five. Let, let's bring these back. Let's get behind bringing these back and start a conversation with you, our listeners, about what you would want to see back. Yeah. So... I know I've actually got more than five, so I've got several (laughs) honorable mentions. Yeah. I may drop one or two in this episode, but if you want to hear all of my honorable mentions, which there's a pretty good list, head on over to patreon.com slash GT Garage Talk and sign up for the $5 a month tier or up, and you will gain access to what we call the aftermarket, where you will get... Just a little bit of extra content from Matt and I and any guests we may have. Uh, just after we get done recording the main episode, we've just got a little bit more for you there. And that's where my list of honorable mentions will fall. But I will go ahead and kick us off. Yeah, let's do it. With uh, the first vehicle that I wish were still around in existence, in production today, and I had to admit, um, I'm just going to get this one out of the way first. It's a little bit of a cheat. Oh. Because it's an entire brand. (laughs) Wait, can I guess? Yes. Pontiac. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) So the Pontiac has had a very iconic and storied history. And I listed five cars in, in particular that I would love to see back the most. Yeah. And I'm pretty sure you could not guess all five of them. Two of them are going to be complete oddballs. Just so long as the Aztec is not on that list, we so, can continue being friends. <laughs> so I will run through my list. <laughs> the GTO. Of course. Because we need more muscle cars. Absolutely. Like proper muscle cars. Even if they are rebadged. Uh, yes, absolutely. Box holes, you know. Yeah. Well, mm, yes. Um, <laughs> I, I loved the, the most recent iteration of the GTO and... So did pretty much anyone who ever drove it. it. The only problem was that people weren't 
buying them and right. driving them so they never knew. Well, you know, fuel crisis yeah. and yeah, stuff like yeah, that. Yeah. So. Obviously, the Firebird. So right. uh, Camaro's my favorite car. It's sister car, the Firebird. Definitely needs to be back. Some would say it's the cooler of the two. And uh, tomato, tomato. Tomato, potato. Tomato, potato. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so GTO, Firebird, Solstice, naturally. Right. That one, uh, you and I have lamented Many, many, many times on this podcast that the solstice went away too soon, especially when it came to the Targa Top yes. version. That coupe, the lines, <sighs> and that it was a beautiful rear wheel drive, manually yep. transmission equipped. Yep. Sports car. Yep. For cheap, like yeah. it checked all the boxes. Oh yeah. It it looked good. It it moved. It just yes. Why? 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 It just um, the next two, I would I would say are more a sign of the times, okay. and I can't believe th- that they're gone or not being sold today for obvious reasons. So the Pontiac Vibe. You're right. You did surprise me. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so essentially, the Pontiac Vibe was a partnership with Toyota. Yeah. And all that was, it, its sister car was the Toyota Matrix. Mm-hmm. And all those cars were, were a taller Toyota Corolla. Yeah. Which, what are we doing in today's market? We're making tall cars. Right. So, like, I was especially fond of the first generation of the Pontiac Vibe. They watered it down too much when they started um, tinkering with it and then the redesign and no, I liked the very first iteration before the refresh, before anything, it, it was funky and cool. And I was 16, I think back at the time I would have been okay having had one, I got uh, you. especially if I remember correctly, it had a really cool out of the dash manual, uh, shifter, uh, not quite a Honda, a Honda civic of the era shifter, but it, yeah, and of course, I wanted the manual transmission version. Uh, the back of it was hard plastic, so you can wipe it down, clean it out really easily, you know, hatchback. It, it checks all the boxes of a car that would sell well today. Sure. And I don't know, I, as a GM fan, I, I really like the style of it. It had Toyota's reliability because it was essentially a Toyota under the skin. Like, why is that not still a thing? Mostly because, well, they're making uh, Teslas in that factory now. <laughs> so that's a thing. Yeah. And then the last uh, one I will um, just uh, leave off my list altogether because we don't need, we don't need to talk about it. It's a Pontiac Aztec. Why? Why? If what? it okay, you, I've no, already no, you, uh, mm, I've already shared. I've got some personal connections uh, to it, so there there's a little bit of sentimentalness in my heart for it, but. Its sister car, the Buick Rendezvous. Rendezvous. <laughs> the Rendezvous. <laughs> sold r- really well during its lifetime here. It was wildly more popular than the Aztec, of It was course. a lot uglier than the Aztec, too. <laughs> Is that possible? <laughs> Most people didn't think, think so. It, it had less controversial lines. It was not pretty, although neither of them were. Yeah. But again, I- in today's market... It's basically a taller. It's a crossover car. Yeah, yeah. It, it 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 shared more in common with the minivans of the time than anything else on the right. platform. But again, it checks all the boxes of what Americans are looking for right now. And controversial styling aside, I think if they came up with a new generation of what it was meant to be. Uh-huh. You know, active lifestyle, crossover, yada, 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 yada. It would sell quite well. Yeah, yeah. So, not the first-gen Aztec. I'm not talking about the hideous thing that everybody loves to, <laughs> you know, critique and pan online. I'm saying if it had gotten a second generation and if it were selling right now, I think it would do quite well. So, what's number one on your list? Well, I I just kind of compiled the list. I will say the Solstice and the... Saturn Sky are on my list. So, I mean, yes. the same car, so I just... You know. Which would you say, do you styling-wise, which, which was your favorite between the, the Solstice the, and the Sky? The GXP Coupe. Yeah. So, Solstice, yeah. 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 So, I stole your thunder with my one, uh, which was really five and one. I'm sorry. That's okay. But I'm not sorry. Yeah, sorry, not sorry. That's good. Yeah. 
All right. So, well, since I took a couple of yours, okay. I'll, I'll catch back up to you. Okay. With another one that kind of relates to my first one. It's not an entire brand. It's a single car. Okay. But the Chevrolet Chevelle. Okay. That is a very classic nameplate that Dodge proved. You could bring a very classic full-size two-door car Uh back into the modern Uh modern era as a four-door car, and people will still buy it and have that nostalgia for it, i.e., Dodge Charger. Right. And I think Chevy kind of did this. They just missed the mark. So they had, again, going back to the GTO that we were talking about earlier, had a rebadged Holden product, and they called it the Chevy SS. Mm -hmm. And everybody loved it. Mm -hmm. That drove it, anyway. Mm -hmm. Styling was kind of understated, but it's kind of what the 70s were all about. It was just your average, you know, run-of-the-mill car. It didn't really stand out as far as styling. It just had a huge V8 under the hood and would go and take the kids to anywhere they needed to go, go grab groceries, all that. So I think Chevy probably could have gotten more money and more sales out of rebadging that car, the Chevelle, than they did just calling it the Chevy SS, which the SS is the performance model of many other versions. So it it was a marketing miss. Now, granted, it didn't save the GTO. But again, two-door cars were kind of dying off. Right. And Pontiac had the uh, G8. Yes. Which was essentially the same car. And it was doing well. Yeah, and it had a weird name, but then the whole brand went away. So what you had is essentially a great car by all measurable metrics except for styling and marketing. Right. That is no more because, well, if you don't market it well, nobody's buying it. And so, yeah, yeah that, that was a, a, a miss for Chevy. And I think they would have caught heat for it as long as Dodge caught heat for bringing back the Charger as a sedan. But I think people would have gotten over it. Well, yeah, and, and they have done that too. Now, I mean, everybody's over the fact that the Charger is a four-door car. It doesn't hurt when you put a 700-horsepower V8 does, under the hood. <laughs> right, that doesn't hurt. Sure. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, there's... There are lots of uh, of badges that could be uh, could have been placed. The uh, Monte Carlo Impala, yeah, uh, you know, either of those yeah. could have been because the Impala nameplate stuck around as a full size car, which they kept the Impala around at the same time that the SS was being sold. And I think again that was an opportunity for them to bring back the nameplate of a four door family hauler with performance history. Oh, yeah. Except for the fact that they already had a four-door family hauler with front-wheel drive and a V6. So, well, yeah. And that, yeah I, Bad timing there. Yeah. Almost would have been advantageous to kill off the Impala and... Well, they did anyway, so it well, uh, just yeah. would have you know, sped up the inevitable. Right, right. But, yeah, I mean, it, I don't know. It, it was just, it was myths all the way around. It was yeah. a great car. I've still actually been pricing used ones online. My wife and I do have a plan for the next vehicle we purchase. I've shared it many times. It's not currently in production. Will be soon. Not giving away any more than that. Very excited about it. But uh, it, it's it's not a Chevy. Yet. Yeah. Although, it- that would... Uh, if, if I bought one of those, <laughs> I would drive it over to meet you without telling you what it is. I'd right. blindfold you, sit you down in it. Uh-huh. And maybe rev it up and see if you could guess. And then, you know, maybe I'm blindfolded, just let you see your surroundings, cover if up you, your badges and yeah, see if yeah. you can figure if, it out that way. If you put me in it and let me, you know, feel around the, the textiles and mm-hmm. the shape of the dash and stuff like that, I bet I could figure it yeah. out. Yeah. I, I was I was a huge fan of the G8 when mm-hmm. they were out, you know, the GT or the GXP. And that was something else, too, that, that they had the advantage of. They had multiple V8s to choose yep. from. Yep. So you could have a, a more entry-level V8, V8 power. Yeah, still powerful, uh, but maybe a little more fuel-efficient-minded right. kind of a thing, and then have the big bad boy right. and put an SS badge on it, you know? Yep. Instead of just calling it the SS and <laughs> what you see is what you get, there were no options. Right. Like, the only options, I think, were uh, sunroof, and maybe the uh, cargo net in the trunk. 
those were the options you got on the SS. So right, and they were all astronomically priced because they were a limited run vehicle and that were fully loaded. Yeah, which you say astronomically priced forty five, which for a V eight that you would basically get in a Corvette rear wheel drive. They ended up making a manual version of it. Like it seriously pains me that I don't have that in my garage instead of my Chevy Cruze Eco. <laughs> well, sure, but. Uh, so that would have been the C5 generation, is that or C6? C6. C6 generation. Mm-hmm. I bet you could have got one of those for 45 Maybe 50 Yeah. Because the base model now are 60 I mean, that was 10 years ago, right? 2008, 9, 10, yeah, somewhere they, in there they, when the SS was out. They officially killed them out, killed them off just like three years ago. So I think 2017, 2018 was the last year you could get them. And right now, I'm going to pull it up as we're talking on yeah. autotrader.com because, like I said, I have been pricing them <laughs> just because I want one so badly. The GTOs, that, we mentioned those earlier. Those are still crazy yeah. money, too. All right. So let's see. We're going Chevrolet. We're going SS and the zip code. And... <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, uh, because people like me understand their true value, the first one that comes up, 42744, it has 23,000 miles on it. It's black. I don't want another black car. And, of course, the only interior option was black, so it's black on black. Yeah. Here's a 2014 for 36,000. 36. And those are the only two in reasonable distance from here. Yeah. But, yeah, I would uh, I'd very much like to have one. Not so the... Lie. The GTOs on Facebook Marketplace, anywhere for there's one on here for nine grand. Yeah. And they go way up from there. <laughs> yeah. Yep. 16.5, yep. 17. That nine grand 14. one probably has torn up seats and right. cracked dash, you know, typical General Motors here's highlights a, of used, well used vehicles. Yeah. Here's a, an 09 G8 GT, which had the smaller V8 in it yep. for nine grand. Yep. I mean, good grief. Like, and the, the, it's still an LS based engine. Yep. yep so yep. the tuning opportunities are endless. Yep. 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 <laughs> you don't need to LS swap it. It's already been done for you. Exactly. <laughs> like so. Uh, so killing Pontiac. Yep. Stupid GM mistake. Yep. And bailout. We, we've yeah, yeah, yeah. We've gone through all that. Go back and listen to uh, Bill's second episode with us. Yes. Uh, clue us in a little bit on that. And then the other stupid mistake was the poor marketing with the. Uh, the rebadged, the rebadged Holden's of, SS, yeah. whatever. Yeah. 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 All right. So, you know, off of my list, onto your list. Okay. What, what you got? Uh, I'm going to shift gears entirely. Okay. No, I'll save those. Oh, wow. I'll save those. Okay. Uh, we'll we'll stay in, in the uh, car vein of things. Okay. 1967. Okay. Mercury. Mm. Cougar. Yes. So that the Cougar, bless its heart. Oh my goodness! <laughs> that name got drugged through the mud. What, what Fomoko did to that rig, uh, someone should be drawn and quartered over that. <laughs> like the, the you know the early two thousands iteration was a big heavy uh, Crown Vic based yeah. two door car, yeah. and it was still I mean four point six V eight. Yeah. Rear drive, you know, if I'm not big, mistaken, comfortable our, car. Our friend Mark had one of those. He and did, and he it was a it. blast of a car. It would move, and it was comfortable. And then they made it front-wheel drive and V6-powered. They wanted like an Eclipse fighter. I, it, for what? I, <laughs> I don't know. The it, Eclipse was all but dead at that point. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I I just go back to the bubble headlights and taillights that they put on that thing. I just, oof. It was not a cougar. What what, it, what they did with it was not a cougar. So to bring back a well, I'm glad you're uh, bringing Fomoco into bad decisions here because you know we were harping on General Motors. Uh, Ford's got their own list. Oh yeah, so, oh yeah. most definitely. Yeah, yeah. I have another uh, Fomoco rig on here that I okay. wish they'd bring back, and it does shift things tremendously. The Ford Econoline pickup. Whoa. <laughs> yeah, that does yeah. Uh, change things just a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Please elaborate. Because well, the Econoline to me, as former youth pastor, is a big white van hauling kids around from one church camp to another. Right. No, I'm thinking the mid-60s Ford Econoline van that had the 302 small block yeah. or the inline six-cylinder 
between the two seats. Oh, boy. And you're sitting about eight inches from the windshield. And then they made a pickup version of it, which, you know, cut it off behind the driver, yep, passenger yep. seat, put a pickup bed behind it. Of course you'd miss something like that, wouldn't you? Absolutely. It's right up your alley. All right. So uh, here's one from that uh, general era that I think you and I have already both agreed on. And we have talked at nauseum on this uh, podcast about the K5 Blazer, GMC Jimmy. You, you know, know what, you know what's funny? Yeah, the Chevy Blazer's on my list. <laughs> See, and I know it would be because uh, uh, such an iconic vehicle. And you brought up Bill Taylor. His first episode, he actually shared with us that his father was the father of the K5 Blazer. Yeah, he is responsible for its existence. So, yeah, it. I, I still remember riding around town with our mutual friend Andy, and he and I both dreaming of buying a K5, just an old junker of a K5, building it up together, rhino lining the whole daggum thing so you could spray it out inside and out, yeah. just having a fun weekend toy. Yeah. And why they don't build anything remotely like that from General Motors nowadays is beyond me because they've got the platforms. They could do it. They have the technology. They could do it. <laughs> and yeah. yet they don't. And, and, and for those of you going, but wait. They are making the Blazer right now. No. No, no they're not. No. They're making a crossover that they just happened to have this Blazer name hanging around about and slapped on the side of it. Yeah. Uh, it, it, you know, uh, as today's voting proves out, uh, just putting the name of something iconic on something new and not anything remotely related to what it currently is, mm -hmm. <clears throat> looking at you, Mustang Mach-E. Uh, Easy. It's Fan, semi-related. Fans don't exactly yeah. jump on board. So, yep. yeah, the uh, as we are recording this, the Mach-E is just being obliterated by the Tesla Model S in our bracket challenge. Now, as you're listening to this, we will already know the results, but I can tell you how that one's going to end, just how <laughs> uh, voting has gone so far today. And, yeah, it, it's, it's not been so pretty. I got to go to Instagram and vote. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I don't think you can vote enough times <sighs> to, to bring that one up. And I even put the GT on, the, on today's pictures because some people vote purely on what picture I post, which, yeah. you know, to each their own, come up with your own sure. uh, methodology. But, yeah. Right. Anyway, so we're not talking about Ford. We're talking about the Blazer and the Jimmy. And, yes, I very much want that back. Oh, yeah. And it would just be so easy. Well, not so easy, but, like, Again, they have the technology. It would be doable. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, you've got the platform. I mean, it would be it would be a bit of a parts bin rig, right? And I'm okay with that at this point because, you know, General Motors has said everything's going to be electric by 2035. So, so we let's know that go out with a bang. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of like Cadillac's yeah. doing with the V8 powered uh, rear wheel drive manual leak clip sedan in the CT5 V Blackwing. Right. Ooh, that's a mouthful. Also yeah. Yeah. on our GT Dream Car Bracket Challenge. It is. It is. So. Um, so, yeah, as I mentioned, Chevy Blazer is on my list. To further the uh, pickup line of things, the Jeep Forward Cab. Okay. And, it, you know, it goes along with the, the 40 Conoline pickup. But that, you know, put everybody right up on the glass mm -hmm. up front, mm -hmm. and then you've got eight feet of bed behind you that would be incredibly useful. Did you know that... From where you are sitting and I am standing right now, there is one within less than a mile of us. Really? Yes. Uh, I've seen it around town a few times, and it is on one of my normal running routes. While I'm out, you know, breathing in all this wonderful pollinated air that has me sniffling right. on this week's episode. Yep, I, I've seen it. He normally keeps it in the driveway covered. Uh, but I've seen him use it for weekend uh, parts getting projects. Saw him at Lowe's. Saw him later that day as I was running with all his goods from Lowe's unloading it at home. So, nice. I, yeah. And I, I am going to correct myself because I just realized it's not a forward cab. That's not what FC stands for. It's forward control. Oh. My okay. bad. Yeah. Somebody would have corrected you. Oh, yeah. So. Yeah. All right, so I'm going to shift gears entirely. I've got two left on my main list, and then all, all the rest are honorable mentions. My next one has actually been owned by a member of my family. Okay. I've driven it. I loved it. I want more of it. 
<laughs> I like it. I love it. Not sponsored. No, not at all. Uh, hap- and the money for that isn't in our budget. And trust me, nobody's. Um, my rendition <laughs> is not getting us anywhere. <laughs> So uh, as with many cars on my list, I was actually surprised how many cars on my list my brother has previously owned, and this being one of them, Honda S2000. Huh. Uh, you didn't expect that one from me, did you? I did not. No, I so, did not. Uh, yeah, Honda S2000. Uh, he had a bright yellow one uh, before the uh, engine retune and the slight exterior redesign. It was actually more powerful per liter. Then when they tweaked it a little bit, uh, I know he said on his episode, I believe episode nine of season one, go back and listen to it, Car Fandoms with Clayton. But uh, yeah, they they did some retooling to it. I think it was more to do with everyday livability, but that car was born out of track aspirations. Yeah. Um, I will say not a great car to road trip to, and from Dallas all on the same day in, which is at best a four-hour round trip from here. He had the benefit of he actually you know, got to pilot it the entire time. Sure. I was trying to get comfortable in the passenger seat, <laughs> feeling every bump in the construction going on at I-35. Of course. Through downtown Dallas. But uh, yeah, that, it was a blast of a car. Uh, like I said, bright yellow. He called it the yellow hotness. Um so, yes, he names his cars, most of them. And I, I remember, I think I shared this story back on his episode, but I'll share it again. Uh, he and I traded vehicles. I had a Silverado at the time. He needed to use it uh, to haul some stuff around. So I was driving the yellow hotness for the day. I had the top down. I went to go get lunch <laughs> at work and stopped at the red light right by work, and I hear, <laughs> and it was manual, obviously, and I knew how to drive stick at the time. I just was not as well practiced as I am now, having driven one consistently for the past eight years. Yeah. So naturally, that flummoxed me enough that I stalled it and killed it right there. <laughs> and uh, the the exhaust he had on that was loud enough. You knew when it died, and you knew when it started back up. So there was no hiding the fact that I had just killed it in right. the middle of traffic right. on the loop in Tyler, Texas. So, <laughs> uh. yes, thank you so much, John, for that. It was just my coworker messing with me, and he succeeded. <laughs> so, yes, but the Honda S2000, awesome car. RPM for days. Yes, uh, I think it had... North of 9,000 RPM Ridiculous. A sweet dash. It was all digital gauge cluster, which was way ahead of its time. I remember it brought back the push button start. Like that was a quote unquote revolutionary thing in that vehicle. The shifter on it was like you just had to think about shifting gears and you were in that gear. (laughs) Like to say short throw is a vast understatement. Uh, It, you thought about it, and you were in that gear. Like it, it was, it was all around great car. Probably a little different than my father in law's two thousand model F two fifty with a diesel and a six speed, huh? A smidge, yeah, a skosh. It's, it's like changing counties to change gears in that truck. <laughs> yeah, to that end, I had my uh, Camaro SS at the same time. My brother had a Jeep JK Wrangler, and. Yeah, I went to go try and speed shift his Wrangler one day, and I was like, whoa, where the heck is <laughs> There's way, way too much travel in that long shifter. But yeah, 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 yeah. That's funny. All right, uh, I have, uh, I'm going to go, let's see. Da, 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 da. I'll pick one. I'll pick one more of the rigs that I have on my list, and I'll save the rest for the aftermarket. Good, because I have one left as well. Okay. I hope you don't steal it. The Subaru Brat oh. slash Baja. Okay. Why not? Like I said, uh, there there is a consistent theme in some of your cars. Might be. You like truck beds on the back of vehicles. I do. Pure and very, simple. Very much so. Well, and like the Subaru Baja, yeah. you could get it with a turbo flat four that's making north of 200 horsepower and have a really fun little low center of gravity all-wheel drive pickup to yep. go play around in the mud with. I mean, it, it, why not? So to that end, I I have to ask you, it's purely rumor and speculation at this point, but everyone within the industry says it's coming. There are pictures, spy photos, everything out. I don't know what the holdup is. (laughs) 
Ford Maverick. Yep. Thoughts? I if it comes out the way it's currently designed, yeah, which I've seen a couple of fully unmasked, uncamouflaged pictures, I'm I'm all about it. Okay. Um, For those of you unaware, it's a compact unibody, so crossover like right mini truck from Ford that is styled eh, a little baby Bronco ish. Yeah, I think I would have liked it better if they had if they had stuck with the lifestyle aspect of Bronco, and we still don't know for sure what it's going to be called, how it's right. going to be branded, any of that kind of stuff. I mean, it, but we. Technically, don't know anything about it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Technically, it doesn't exist yet, but it needs to be a little smaller from what I've seen. Yeah. It's too close to the size of the Ranger. And if they had used a few more cues from the Bronco Sport and and just made it a Bronco Sport with a pickup bed, I have an issue calling the Ridgeline a truck. Right. Because it is yeah, SUV based, front engine. Transversely mounted, mm-hmm. whether it's all wheel drive or front wheel drive, it's the engine's the wrong direction, and there are no frame rails. That's not a body on chassis setup. So I have a heavy issue calling the Ridgeline a truck. And in essence, this Maverick would be. It's going to end up falling into the same vein as the Ridgeline, and yeah. it, it it hurts me to even speak those words. <laughs> Except, just don't classify it a pickup. Yeah, but they're gonna. But it's not. <laughs> yeah, but they're gonna. <laughs> I know they will, and it's that. It's that. Uh, um, okay, another one on my revive list is the right. Chevy Love pickup. Okay, that was a pickup. Right. Front engine, rear drive, longitudinally mounted frame rails, cab and bed on frame. Mm-hmm. Right. It's it's a truck. It just happens to be three and a half foot wide and eight feet long. You know, little bitty sucker. Yeah. But you can't. You could. It would not be cost effective to build a small truck that way now, right. especially with the platforms that they have. Now, one, and with fuel economy being the name of the game. Right. One thing I think will help it a lot is that if they do like they have the Bronco Sport and all of them will be all wheel drive, mm-hmm. uh, that will help. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I agree. And, and if they will. If they will offer both engine options, not just the three-cylinder, but the uh, four-cylinder EcoBoost Turbo, I think that will help a lot. One thing that would help that they're not going to do, a manual transmission. Oh, uh, yeah. But. All of this is all speculation at this point, and we will be all over it if and when, more so when, not if, for it actually decides to share details with the rest of us. So the last one on my list before all the honorable mentions, and we're running a little longer on time because I still have another segment I'm going to dive into just a little bit before we call it a day on this week's episode. Okay. But the last one on my list, talking about backsides of vehicles. Oh, boy. I think you know where I'm going. The amplest of all backsides, the Plymouth, the Plymouth Prowler. Prowler. Yep. That one, again, just just a little bit of a miss when it came to the performance, yeah. it had all the looks. Uh, it, it just, it, mm, mm, mm. it was right there. They're <laughs> so close. <laughs> but uh, did not quite make it because they essentially put a minivan engine in it. Right. And made it purely a showpiece on wheels. It was not a corner carver, it, it was not a drag racing car. Hennessy Performance made it so they stuffed some uh, big V8s under the hood with some creative packaging, which if you've ever seen a Plymouth Prowler, you know is quite a feat in itself because Indeed. it basically comes to a point at the front. Purely beautiful vehicle with a matching trailer. Has to oh, absolutely. Trailer. And it has to be purple. Yeah. I don't know. Like uh, there was one last week on Cars and Bids. It was from the last year it was produced, so therefore it was at that point a Chrysler Prowler. Right. Because Plymouth died before the Prowler did. And it was, uh, I can't remember the special edition it was, and y'all can roast me in the comments, but beautiful navy blue. And like I said, it was a special heritage edition. It was like the going away model. I I could look it up, but it, it, it was a beautiful, beautiful dark blue. And I don't know if you've noticed by all my Apple accessories, I have a dark blue problem, yeah. a navy blue problem. Yeah. My Apple Watch band, my phone, my phone case. Your glasses. My glasses, my AirPods case. Um, 
what else do I have in that snake? I mean, navy blue, all the things. Yep. So, yeah. Naturally, hook, line, and sinker with that one. Oh, yeah. So I will just tease our listeners with a few of my honorable mentions, uh, not by name, but uh, I've got another whole brand on my list. Okay. I've got a 007 car on oh, my boy. list. I've got another JDM fanboy car on my list, believe it or not. <laughs> I've got one of my old vehicles on this list. I've got yet another JDM fanboy car oh my on my list. And yet another, and yet another. <laughs> so, Good grief. Um, yeah, you wouldn't expect that from me, would you? I would not. So no. uh, you'll just have to stick around and head on over to patreon.com slash talk if you want to hear my full list of honorable, honorable mentions. And perhaps you'll see uh, my Fast and Furious side coming out in, in in that list of cars that I wish I thought were you didn't like in. those movies, Corey. The first few were really good. Uh, well, the first no, one, weren't. the second one was terrible. I never saw Tokyo Drift, and we've gotten into this discussion one too many times on this podcast. One of these days, I'm going to make you sit down and watch all of them, start to finish, oh, front to back. no. See, yep. I did that with the Harry Potter series, and I liked the Harry Potter series. Exactly. All the way through, and that was a Eating in and of itself, mostly because it's still beautiful weather outside, and I would have rather have been outside. But anyway, we, anyway, should, we, we digress. Should, yeah, we should rent out an entire theater in East Texas and watch all of the movies back to back to back to back to back. If we had all our fans with us, maybe I could do that. But that that is quite a commitment. So I'm not signing this up for anything yet, but you're on to something, sir. All right, before we finish this week's episode and run this straight into the ground... <laughs> Just to prove that we're not all just nostalgic over all these cars that we wish were here. I've got a short list, okay. nowhere near as long, of vehicles that are still being sold as brand new today that I have no idea why. I have three. I have four. Okay. And I bet we have an overlap. Probably. Uh, because I have more, I'll go first. Fine. Purely for that reason. And I actually have sales numbers to back all my claims up. Um, oh, see, I didn't go that fancy. See, three of my four the sales prove my point. And the fourth one, special circumstances, we'll get into it when we get there. So this is probably the one most likely to be on both of our lists. Nissan Kicks. I don't understand the Nissan Kicks. And it's so it's their entry-level crossover SUV. It just got a second generation. Uh, the first generation was frumpy, to say the least. <laughs> uh, less so than the Juke it replaced. Where the Juke was weird and different and ugly, the Kicks is boring and blah and ugly. Mm. And I much prefer you being weird and different and trying something than, you know, checking all the vanilla boxes. Yeah, it is pretty vanilla. Which, you know is why Aztec was on my list earlier and the Rendezvous, as you dubbed it, <laughs> uh, was not because the Rendezvous was meant to appeal to as many people as possible and help share some of the cost of that platform. And the Aztec was supposed to be this weird, cool, funky, different thing that nobody liked. Yep. So Nissan Kicks, I get it. It's supposed to be your volume, cheap mover of a vehicle in the crossover segment. Yeah. I, I'm just, ugh. Not a fan. And so... Is uh, it, it falls into the sub crossover, doesn't it? Right. Yeah. So 2018, 2019, and 2020 sales are what I have pulled up in front of me. Okay. And it, it, it's doing respectable. So uh, in its first year, 2018, 23,000. Uh, 2019, 58,000. And then 2020, we all know what happened that year. Uh, it held its own and actually had a slight increase, 50, 58,858, about seven, six, 700 uh, more units in a year that was statistically down for production. Yeah. So. I would say, moment of confession, uh -huh. um, I had to Google it because uh -huh. I didn't know what it was. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. That's probably most people's issue with it is that... It's just so blocked. Nobody knows what it is. It's not sticking out. It's not... And, and that's some of the issues that Nissan's trying to curb with the new second generation that's just out as a 2021, I believe, as... You know, they're putting a lot of money behind it. Uh, it's got a pretty good built-in stereo system. It's got speakers in the headrest. They're trying to make it the youth, active, fun vehicle. But, yeah, it, it's just, it's blah. Yeah, pretty much. Your turn. Mini Clubman. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No. No. Yep. Yeah. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. No sense. Not makes said. no sense. Uh, the whole <laughs> mini brand, I'm not saying the whole mini brand needs to be X, but they're trying to build a brand around a singular nostalgic car. Right. And they've they've taken it too far. It's like making a four-door Beetle. Yeah. It and just doesn't work. I'm kind of surprised that never happened, but uh, that's essentially what VW is. Well, that's what the Golf is. Well, that's what the ID4 is, too. It's yeah, the new. Uh, it's <laughs> Right. It, they, that's what they're trying to make it. Right. But, the, the the current Beetle is a golf with different skin. Right. So there's no difference in it. There's no performance model. There's yeah. no – and people – in order to be the people's car, it has to move people. Right. And you can't get in the back seat of those cars very well at all. So – My wife had a Mini Cooper, you know, the standard Mini Cooper hatchback, though she argues with me to this day on whether it was actually a hatchback. It, it was a hatchback. <laughs> it was not built – designed and engineered for American roads. It was cool. It was funky. It came in great colors. I like the the brand itself. Right. The John Cooper Works versions, uh, especially the GP, are crazy insane. The new GP has 300 horsepower and a tiny little box on wheels. <laughs> like, I credit the Italian job with actually making me like those vehicles because right. uh, when they first came back, I was like, no, ugly, stupid, hate it. And then Italian job came out, and what do you know? I kind of like it now. The rest is history. But yeah, they, they've stretched that brand just a little bit too far. Yeah, a little bit. A little so, bit. Next one on my list, Fiat 500L. Bull. Bull. Along the same lines as the Clubman. It's just not worth it. Oh, my gosh. It's just like, not worth it. And, and you know, um, I believe you have spoken with your buying power and your sales dollars. Granted, over this time frame that I'm about to quote, uh, a lot of Fiat dealers have closed, and the brand is struggling to maintain a foothold here. Since FCA became Stellantis, uh, they've announced instead of bringing Peugeot over, which most people like us would love to see. Oh, yeah. Stellantis is going to sink more money into trying to establish Fiat a little bit further. So 2013 is the first year I've got sales data pulled up in front of me, and its nearest makes no difference, 7,000 units. 2014 was its heyday, 12,413. Wow. That was the peak, and it's been all downhill since. So I, I 8, have 8,000, 3,000, 1,000, 1,771, oh. and in 2020, 475. 475 units. Yeah. That's nuts. Yeah. So why are we why are we still selling this car? That's like supercar level number of cars for junk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's frumpy. It's oh, the yeah. best word to describe it. Where the kicks was blah, this is frumpy. It, it's not a pretty car. So, I'm sorry, Stellantis fans. No. I'm sorry, no. Kimberly. <laughs> but no, not on my list. One of the drivers that I work with has a 500, just a regular plain Jane Fiat 500. It's cut steel wheels. Just simple, plain little car. Uh, she lives in Kilgore, drives to White House to drive a bus every day. Yeah. So she puts a lot of miles on her car. She's had the car, I think, about 10 years. I don't know for sure what year it is. Yeah. But it's got over 200,000 miles on it. Well, She's had it in the shop being worked on and stuff lately. She's got a good warranty on it, so they're taking care of all of it. But they offered her $500 for that car <laughs> on trade-in. $500. You sell the parts for more than that. Yeah. Whew. Yeah, and the 500L is just the worst the worst but, of the worst. But yeah. Stellantis has an uphill battle for sure when it comes to... The brand recognition as of late. Uh, most people do not think of the rebadged, reskin Miata that they're selling. Right. They think of the 500L. Right. And yeah, it, it, granted the 500X, which is basically what the Jeep Renegade is with different skin, it's a somewhat appealing vehicle. And that's where they're really putting their money and time and energy. But the 500L... Yeah. That's what the L stands for, by the way. <laughs> That's funny. All right, I'm going to pick on Famoco. Okay. Ford Fusion. If you're going to kill off every other car but the Mustang, mm -hmm. why is the Fusion hanging around? So that one's surprising to me because uh, that one uh, got a just beloved send-off from the uh, Top Gear crew, uh, the Grand Tour crew. Uh, as the Ford Mondeo. Right. Uh, I thought when the current iteration came out that it was a stunner of a vehicle because it looked like an Aston Martin. Oh, it looks 
It looks fine. To be fair, it, it's only still hanging around because I haven't sold all of them because nobody's buying them. So, but exactly. yeah, it, it's officially dead. So, uh, which kind of brings me to my next one, and I'm going to pick on Chevy for a little bit. <laughs> I got like, a Chevy on my list, too. Don't worry. Like, uh, the Chevy Trax. Oh, goodness. Yeah. yeah. So, no. uh, I will say so, this is the one that uh, had a little bit of a longer story. So, its sales numbers are only really picking up steam. 106,000 units sold in 2020, wow. which is only slightly down from 117K in 2019 it is moving and again it is chevy's entry level crossover it's frumpy it's not pretty that being said chevy is officially killing it off and it is being replaced by the not greatly named trailblazer (laughs) but i do like the trailblazer eons and eons heads and shoulders above the chevy tracks i'm curious to know if those numbers include the encore from buick as well buick's encore was like a, a slam dunk for the Buick brand. Yeah. Because everybody's just been scooping those. I see those pretty much anytime I leave my house. They're everywhere. Here. Yeah. No, uh, I'd say that those Chevy Trax numbers, like I said, it's GM's mainstream brand and it's their entry level crossover. It's selling a, a lot because it's cheap. Uh, I wonder how many of those are fleet sales, but that's another story. But yeah, yeah. You're, y- y'all are out there buying them. I'm not quite sure why. <laughs> Go buy a Trailblazer instead. Uh, if, if you want a small entry level crossover from Chevy, the Trailblazer is infinitely better than it, and um, and rip the badge off as soon as you get it. Right, but I will say uh, there are probably some great incentives on the tracks right now, so you could probably, probably get one so. for yeah. like stupid cheap fifteen k for a brand new car. Don't quote me on that, but yeah. you know, not gonna lie, you probably. Could find a really good deal. Probably, yeah, you probably could. You got one more for us? Because I got one left. I got one more. Also in the uh, General Motors uh, vein of things, the Chevy Sonic. That one, I do believe, is officially dead. It is? Yeah. Okay. Well, see. That's another one. So I've driven one as a rental vehicle. I really wanted an RS, but obviously they don't get the cool ones that you would actually want to drive at, at the rental car places. When I bought my Chevy Cruze, I was torn between a Sonic RS, because it was Chevy's little hot hatch, or my Cruise Eco, uh, both were going to be a manual transmission. They were priced about the same because the Cruise is a bigger car, and that's ultimately what won out was I I wanted more space than what the little Sonic was going to allow me. But Well, that's... Could you see me in a Sonic right now? No. No, I couldn't either. Not at all. I guess that's kind of my point. Uh, And I I have actually driven the RS, Mm -hmm. and they're fun. Yeah. They're quick. A little turbo Um, engine, front wheel drive. I think it's got the same motor in it that your car has. Yep. Uh, So a little less wheelbase, more compact design, and and, and a motor that's got a pretty decent little power range. So they're not bad, but there's nothing to them. You get... Four and a quarter seats. Yep. And <laughs> no storage. And 40 no, yeah. miles to the gallon. Uh, whoop de doo Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't put anything behind the back seats. Nope. <laughs> there's there's no, there, yeah, there is no storage in it. It is an engine and four and a quarter seats. That's it. Yep. I remember when they first unveiled those, uh, a lot of the styling and themes were uh, derived from motorcycles. Like the little gauge cluster was supposed to be like a, motorcycle gauge cluster. There wasn't a whole lot to it. Very simple, just gave you the basic information. I bet two motorcycles weighs more than that car does. <laughs> but that says a lot for, you know, having a fun little hot hatch. So, yeah. My next car, my last one on uh, my list of cars I can't believe are still being sold in the U.S. is about the same size, but is from a German brand, and that is the BMW i3. Little electric, frumpy, box-on-wheels thing. And uh, it, too, has not seen recent sales success. It, it's waning off, but uh, you can still buy one new if you want one. Go on BMW.com and find one for yourself. But no, I'm good. Its heyday was 2015 with 11,000 units. 2020 saw 1,508. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Why is that ugly little box still being sold? Now, BMW has announced that they plan on replacing it. Uh, and the replacement gets the ugly corporate beaver tail, buck tooth, whatever you want to call it, terrible grill that yeah. they 
have been putting on all their vehicles lately. I, I just, oh. Uh, so if you want to check that out, BMW, BMW, I can't say it quick, BMWUSA.com. <laughs> check out the iX, which I'm pretty sure it, it's bigger than the i3. It, it is meant to replace uh, the i3 as far as, you know, the electric crossover in their lineup. And oh, I'm, I'm looking at it now. It's... Oh, it is not pretty. <laughs> so not pretty. So not great. And that's our list of vehicles that we wish we could still buy new here in the states, and uh, some of the ones that have us scratching our heads as to why you can still buy them new here in the states. They should we, die. We cannot wait to hear from you <laughs> what makes your list both on the pros and cons side of things. So head on over to Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Let us know on those platforms, or you can shoot us an email, gtgaragetalk at gmail.com. Head on over to our website. We've got links to it all, gtgaragetalk.com. And while you're surfing the interwebs, be sure to jump over to SEMA's website and sign the petition, email your senator and congressman, all that good stuff. And uh, be sure to share every Bronco video you can this week. Oh, man. Disrupting Easter Jeep Safari. I love it. And until next time, bye. Bye.